York in the Gilded Age, a time when the city was full of ambition. It's an age of tremendous wealth, an age of a certain amount of ostentation. This architect and tastemaker was determined to make New York as beautiful as any European capital. He was a great artist, he had great taste. His clients were the biggest names in New York society. They were the richest and most powerful of the plutocrats in uh, New York banking. He was a man about town. He went to everything. There wasn't a party that he didn't attend on any night. If there was an opening at the opera, he was there. A showman who gave us a great pleasure palace. This was a completely original building. Nobody had ever put anything like this together. He created beautiful homes and beloved public monuments. Stanford White was one of America's greatest artistic talents of all time. He was spectacular in life and in death. <whistles> Treasures of New York, Stanford White. Funding for Treasures of New York, Stanford White is provided by the Maringoff Family Foundation, the Paul W. Zucker Foundation, the New York State Council on the Arts, with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature, and Kenneth J. Lane. And now, here's your host, Dick Cavett. Pretend that you're on Jeopardy. Here's the answer. He was known not only for his soaring architectural genius and the magnificent buildings he created, but for a fabulous personality, a life marked by adventure, high romance, and not incidentally, murder. And so the question would be, who is Stanford White? I'm sure you didn't say who's Donald Trump. Anyway, we will get to all of that in the next hour. Th this is a truly great American story of wonderful talent, of hard work, dedication to goals, uh, richness of personality, adventure, flamboyant, colorful living, fortunes won and lost, and uh, violence. You know, these are the ingredients of so many compelling stories, and no, we won't omit the part about murder. This is the story of a larger-than-life citizen of America and New York, and a story well worth your seeing and hearing. Some would call it stranger than fiction, or at least as strange, and it's the story of the legendary Stanford White. At the foot of New York's Fifth Avenue, there's a glorious destination, Washington Square Park. On its north end, the park is crowned by a triumphal arch. It's a 19th century declaration of New York City as a world capital, and its architecture is the equal of anything one could see in London, Paris, or Rome. If you were to just name one structure that Stanford White should be remembered by, really, it's the Washington Arch. Designed in 1889 by American architect Stanford White, the arch was the capstone of a great event. Stanford White was seen as a man who really understood celebration, whether it was a private celebration or a public celebration. And he had been asked by a committee to help essentially sort of decorate parades. He orchestrated the decoration of the city in connection with these parades. So when you wanted to have a good parade, you got a hold of Stanford White. In this case, it was a celebration marking the centennial of George Washington's inauguration in New York. Stanford White was appointed director of the event, and he designed a triumphal arch, a temporary structure made of wood, plaster, and straw. And he even found in an antique shop an old statue of George. Uh, and he put it on the top of this temporary arch. And then he ran up and down Fifth Avenue, making himself really, really sick, because he stayed up for something like 36 hours, stringing these Japanese lanterns from house to house, so that as you made the path up Fifth Avenue to 57th Street in the centennial parade, you had a glittering and glorious vista. Modeled after the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, the Arch was so popular that New Yorkers raised the money to create the permanent monument, which now graces Washington Square Park. 
I would venture to say the arch is the most famous monument in New York City, maybe next to the Statue of Liberty, but certainly as a city-owned monument in the heart of Greenwich Village, and whenever you say the Washington Arch, people know it. Less is known about the life of its designer, Stanford White, celebrity artist and architect, impresario, tastemaker, citizen of New York. Stanford White is among the greatest American architects of the 19th and 20th centuries. He was a great artist. He had great taste. He was very flamboyant. You know, he had red hair in what we would call a crew cut. Stanford White was a towering figure of New York's gilded age. White was moving so fast that he was leaving before he arrived. I mean, just always on the go, always opportunistic in a really remarkable way. He was full of life, full of beans. And throughout his prolific career, he was full of surprises, like this one. A lot of people don't realize, but there's actually um, a small door on the west side of the arch with a spiral stair that takes you up to an attic space. And that attic space is actually visible from the outside of the Washington Arch. If you look up uh, and you see the attic level where there's an eagle, that's essentially where the floor of the attic is where we're standing today. Stanford White was quite simply spectacular in life and in death. You know, when you're the subject of a scandal at the end and you get shot by your girlfriend's husband on the top of one of your most famous buildings, that tends to put you in a very special place in the pantheon of architects. When America's richest playboy, Harry K. Thaw, walked to the table of Stanford White, America's most renowned architect, and shot him dead with a solid gold revolver. I did it because he ruined my wife. More than a century after his death, many remember White more for the story of his murder than for the many accomplishments of his life. Stanford White's manner of death may have hurt his reputation, but in the long run, it gives people some way to remember him. The story of Stanford White lives through his art. The buildings and monuments that he gave New York and the nation. It's the story of one man's passion for beautiful things and his lifelong exuberance for creating, sharing, and celebrating its uniquely American vision. White is the first exemplar of a time in which Americans designed something that may have origins in Europe and may come from the artistic tradition of Europe, but we put it together in a way no one has ever done it before. And in the 1880s, Stanford White was one of America's greatest artistic talents of all time. Stanford White was born in New York City in 1853 to journalist and Shakespeare scholar Richard Grant White and his wife, Alexina. His father did not have money at all, and he was a dandy and a, a serious Anglophile, uh, but he never was able to make very much money. So while Stanford had no great wealth, he did have his father's connections in the New York art world. He had an enormous circle of friends in artistic milieu, and so he was able to assist his son. That circle included painter John Lafarge, decorative artist Louis Comfort Tiffany, and landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted. Stanford White was not trained as an architect. He came to it instinctively, he learned. That was not so unusual in those days, but, but more and more architects were trained, usually at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. Unable to afford formal training, Stanford began showing his watercolors and sketches around New York. And at the age of only 18, he landed an apprenticeship with Henry Hobson Richardson, an up-and-coming architect who had all the formal training that Stanford White did not. He worked for Richardson for six years, and that was the greatest education in America. 
Richardson's career was just taking off when his office won a competition in 1872 to redesign Trinity Church in Boston's Copley Square, White and another architect, Charles McKim, were part of the team. In 1878, his apprenticeship completed, White traveled to Europe where he spent a year sketching and painting and developing an interest in decorating. Back in the States, the economy was booming with wealthy New Yorkers looking for lavish European-style homes. The city and the people who were moving and shaking the city wanted to express their wealth and their status in a variety of ways. And the most visible way, because it was on the street, was architecture. Stanford White was on an upward ascent just when these commissions were available. White returned to New York in 1879 and sought out his friend from Boston, Charles McKim, now in partnership with architect William Rutherford Mead. McKim and Mead had great strengths as architects, but their decorative skills were not there, and they realized it. And so McKim and Mead needed somebody who could really sketch easily and well, and who also had a flair for interiors. The architectural firm of McKim, Mead & White was born. Stanford White started practicing architecture at a time when architecture became sufficiently complicated that it required a collaboration, and McKim, Mead & White was organized to allow for the collaborative participation of different disciplines under this single umbrella of the firm. And in fact, the partners would say that no work should be attributed to any one partner that it always represented the work of the firm. They were the first modern architectural firm. I don't mean stylistically. I mean in corporate organization. They became the first really enormous modern firm in the United States, mainly by the trick of running with a room full of very talented young men working in the office so the principals in the firm could go out and get jobs. And in late 19th century America, there were plenty of clients. What they were able to do is rise at that time, just as new money is rising. So even though they would have all socially and philosophically and consider themselves part of the old America, they built for the new. And they built for the robber barons and the railroads, etc. Well, it's people like the Vanderbilts. Cornelius Vanderbilt was a shipping and a railroad fortune. Uh, J.P. Morgan is very involved in finance and creating the corporate structures of the country. Andrew Carnegie comes to New York, but he has great steel mills. Uh, there's great mines in the West. So it's natural resources, but it's also financial investments, and it's also railroads and steel. For this new America, McKim, Mead, and White created private homes and clubhouses as well as churches, public buildings, and monuments all over the country. But it was in New York society that the firm, and especially its charismatic frontman, Stanford White, found a sweet spot. He worked for all of the robber barons and became the empresario of their self-image. As their clients got richer, they picked up new clients and they became the leading architects of the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age, a 40-year period after the Civil War, when the American economy exploded during Reconstruction. It's an age of tremendous wealth, an age of a certain amount of ostentation, Post-Civil War New York, late 19th century New York, uh, was going through radical transformations, uh, just like the country was. Actually, the country had been united at the end of the Civil War, and so you had a huge national market, and you had new trains connecting the country from east to west. As the financial and cultural capital of the country, New York City came to epitomize the Gilded Age. So in New York, while these great houses are being built, and there's these lavish private balls. It's also the time when some of the great civic monuments we live with are built. The Brooklyn Bridge is built. 
the Statue of Liberty is created, the Metropolitan Museum of Art is founded, the Museum of Natural History is founded and built, the Metropolitan Opera is founded and built. But one consequence of this new wealth was a huge disparity between the have and have-nots, satirized in Mark Twain's novel, The Gilded Age. It describes an America of contradictions where serious societal problems were veiled, gilded, you might say, under a thin coat of gold. And that's one of the interesting things about the Gilded Age, that on the one hand, it's looking forward and it's kind of egalitarian with things like electricity, which everybody can take advantage of, or photography, which everybody can see and use in magazines and newspapers. And then it's also very much elite and a certain group of wealthy people trying to imitate the aristocracy of Europe. Stanford White and his partners were among the many beneficiaries of this new wealth. Stanford White was the architect to see the conspicuous consumption of wealth and its expression through architecture as a marketing opportunity. Stanford White had a personality to match the times. He was very flamboyant, and he was always dashing about the city. Because he went to everything. There wasn't a party that he didn't attend on any night. If there was an opening, if there was an opera, he was there. And the next morning, people would say, I saw White at the opera last night. And people would say, but I saw him at the Vaudeville. He was in all of those places. Of course, he had an eye for the ladies. He had a very rich wife, which helped. White was married to a woman named Bessie Smith, who, as part of a socially prominent Long Island family, deepened his sphere of influence. His early work came as a result of these high society connections and collaborations. Certainly, Stanford White's vision of this architecture required a lot of collaboration. These buildings had a huge amount of decoration. In 1882, Henry Villard, president of the Northern Pacific Railway, hired McKim, Mead and White to build six houses, modeled after an Italian Renaissance palace at 50th and Madison Avenue. There is this just extraordinary collaboration with the best tile setters, masons, wood carvers, upholsterers, light fixture designers, and all being sort of led by Stanford White to create uh, this sort of opportunity to spend unimaginable amounts of Henry Villard's money and getting something really good in the bargain. White's team included artists such as Augustus and Gaudens and Maitland Armstrong. Together, they created an interior masterpiece filled with lush murals, hand-carved mantles, stained glass, and elaborate mosaics. Although Villard lost his money, and he never occupied the homes, they were completed under new ownership. The Villard houses, today the home of the New York Palace Hotel, established the firm as architects of spectacular private homes and Stanford White as an extraordinary architect and tastemaker. He showed people that he could in fact manage a team of artists and craftsmen and produce these sort of extraordinary works. Now there were new and larger projects from the scions of New York society, the Vanderbilts, the Astors, the Whitneys, and a commission from the Park Avenue Armory, the headquarters of the 7th New York Militia, nicknamed the Silk Stocking Regiment because so many of its members were New York Blue Bloods. Stanford White was among the architects and designers hired to decorate the building's formal rooms. He was really a, a remarkable putter together of materials. I think that was his greatest skill. He could put together marble with, with rugs, with pieces of metal, with color, with painters, with a young Louis Comfort Tiffany, and they could collaborate on making a really unique interior. Like the veterans' room, where White wrapped the supporting columns with chains. He uses bullet shell colors. It, it, it interlaces, all sorts of things. I think what he was trying to do there in their, in their own imaginative way and as collaborators was create something that takes the nastiness of war and makes it pretty. 
Soon, the firm became known as designers of private clubs, many of them still operating today. McKinney and White wouldn't have had a career, I think, if it hadn't been for the 1880s and those clubs. Private men's clubs became prominent in New York in the decade following the Civil War. That's when many people decided that being gregarious, having friends, going to dinner, uh, had a lot of fun for men and a lot of good business connections. It was the clubs that set them up. The clubs were gold mines, full of wealthy potential clients for McKim, Mead and White. If you look at their clients and you look at membership rosters, it is literally from those rosters that they got the boost to start their careers. The early clubs were housed in private homes, but as rosters grew, members began commissioning the purpose-built club. Once they had built a couple of these clubs, I think people could see that, that McKinney and White really understood the club program, and what they really understood was how to make the building sort of express the spirit of the membership. There was the Century Club for artists. So that the Century Association, when you look at that from the outside, it, it looks like a, a building that sort of contains the sort of artistic and intellectual energy of Florence in the 15th century. The Players Club for actors and theatricals, which White renovated and redecorated, and the Metropolitan Club at Fifth Avenue and 60th Street. You get the sense that you are looking at a powerhouse. The mechanics of that were that he could create a private courtyard so that members who were arriving by carriage could come into the courtyard uh, and then be able to walk into the front door of the Metropolitan Club without being uh, assaulted by uh, the hoi polloi. And when you consider who the members of the Metropolitan Club were, uh, they had good reason to be concerned about this. Members included the biggest names in New York society. They were the richest and most powerful of the plutocrats in uh, New York banking uh, and finance and industry. Uh, so it, it served a private purpose, but in exchange for that, it was this gift to the street that the gates of the Metropolitan Club are this sort of example of kind of unexcelled architectural generosity. And that is certainly a very small price to pay to allow some plutocrats to go into their club uh, without being uh, assaulted. This is a period where people gave up the tradition of entertaining at home exclusively, and they would have dinners in restaurants and balls and ballrooms that they rented rather than um, entertaining at home. So there was a shift in how people um, spent their evenings. Stanford White now turned his attention to creating public gathering places. I think he was clearly obsessed with Madison Square Garden. There's no question about that. Madison Square Garden was a great pleasure palace. It may be the first great pleasure palace built in the United States, certainly at a Greek scale. A Beaux-Arts structure with a Moorish twist and an abundance of ornament. It commanded a wonderful sight of the northeast corner of Madison Square, which was the great fashionable location in the uh, 1870s on until the First World War, basically. This was a completely original building. Nobody had ever put anything like this together. White didn't stop at designing the building. He orchestrated what would go on inside. White himself, one of his genius skills was as a showman. He was like a Ziegfeld in a way. He wanted it to have all the usual things that you would have in an entertainment palace, but more, anything that was new, anything that was topical. And he went abroad and looked at hippodromes and that sort of thing in London and in Paris and bought outfits for everybody. And he was going to dress them in what would have seemed to us really gaudy costumes. But he got the building together and the building was to have the old stuff of the old New York. Like um, horse shows, auto shows, circuses, and even physical culture competition. There was also going to have those new pugilist games, boxing, and then he was going to put in anything new like vaudeville. 
And he built this building with great rooms and a rooftop terrace. A nightclub in the sky. Rooftop gardens were popular in Europe, so Stanford White gave New York one of its own. He put in something so new and spectacular that everybody was just floored. On the opening day, a nice June evening, people sat in the cafe, there was a ceiling above them, and they pressed a button, and very slowly and silently, the roof left the space. In 15 minutes, they were open to the sky. On Madison Square Garden, Stanford White not only sort of came up with the decorative idiom of the wrapping, but he came up with the idea for the tower. And the tower was not in the original program. The tower was modeled after a Spanish cathedral, but instead of topping it with a religious symbol, White cooked up another surprise with his friend and collaborator, sculptor Augustus St. Gaudens. Well, the collaboration between Stanford White and Augustus St. Gaudens uh, reached its apotheosis at a popular level uh, in connection with this statue. This is Diana uh, that St. Gaudens designed to go on the top of Stanford White's Madison Square Garden. Diana, a pagan goddess of the hunt. And when it was first created, this statue was uh, made in an 18-foot tall version, which was hoisted up to the top of the tower at Madison Square Garden. And uh, everybody stood back and looked at it. And at first, they were shocked, because this was the first nude uh, on a piece of public sculpture in America. Shocking as she was, Diana became a New York icon. Apparently, it was lit with electric lights. There was a ring of, of lights at the base of the statue, and it was quite high up. It was about 350 feet up in the air. And uh, apparently, at night, when it was lit up, you could see it from as far away as Greenwich, Connecticut. And it was sort of everybody's favorite part of New York. I mean, it was this sort of lovely thing to look up and see in a time when New York was really not a very pretty place. Stanford White was doing his best to make New York City as beautiful as any European capital. A mission manifested in another public building he designed for New York University. Just a building that is a treat to look at. I mean, every part of it you look at just gives you something back. It's another one of these sort of Stanford White gifts to the observer. The Gould Memorial Library the jewel and the crown of what was then the uptown campus of New York University in the Bronx. For the undergraduate college, White created a pastoral U-shaped plan. The library, completed in 1903, was at its center. It was really overwhelming the first time I came here. I mean, walking up the stairs and not quite knowing uh, what I was going to find, and then entering into the rotunda. One of the things they were most intent on is creating a sort of picturesque effect. They didn't want to create a grand, overpowering urban building. They wanted a building that worked in the landscape. So it's built out of a very soft, colored yellow brick so that it blends with the landscape. Uh, and it was designed as the centerpiece of the campus, because what could be more important to a university than having the library at the center? Modeled after the Pantheon in Rome, the library is situated high on a hill overlooking the Harlem River. The views are so spectacular that White planned an ambulatory that would go around the library where students and faculty could come and walk and look at the views out over Harlem towards what's now Fort Tryon Park and out to the, the Palisades on the other side of, of the Hudson River. And then in the late 1890s, they decided that why not just make it something special. Why just have an ambulatory? They would turn it into a hall of fame for great Americans. And that's what it, it became. A hall for great American men, mostly. Including George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and White's good friend, Augustus and Gardens. The flowing ambulatory and the muted straw-colored bricks making up the building's facade belie what a visitor discovers inside. Stanford White was very, very 
conscious of drawing people into a building in the most dramatic way possible. You're really not necessarily prepared for it from what you see outside, and then you go in and you're just overwhelmed by the, the incredible beauty and lushness of the interior. You approach the library down an alley of trees that leads right to the front door. You walk up a few stairs through the portico of the library, then into a very low-scale revolving door, and straight ahead of you is this spectacularly grand Renaissance-inspired staircase. Of course, you're drawn up the stairs to discover what's, what's really there and what's gonna be the culmination of this long approach uh, into the building. And then you go through the doors into the library, and suddenly the space just opens up. You see the dome, and it just creates this ecstatically beautiful interior. An interior which was once filled with books, read at tables in the rotunda. Surrounding the rotunda is a group of small private offices called seminary rooms, where students met with their professors in each academic field. So there would be a seminary room for philosophy and a seminary room for geology. Uh, and all the books for that department would, would be in that room and the professor would be there and the students uh, would have a sort of home-like feeling in the department in which they majored. Here again, another white surprise. So everywhere you looked, you would see books. But behind the books, there were rooms. And in order to get into the stacks and the seminary rooms, you could do it through moving bookcases. And you can see that the bookcases, in some cases, opened and allowed you into the rooms behind. 16 columns of Irish Connemara marble, which White called the most beautiful green marble in the world, support the shining dome. You see the marble columns, you look up, and there is the spectacular dome. Uh, it's a very rich, three-dimensional dome. It has coffers with flowered rosettes uh, in it, so it's, it's very richly done. Surrounded by 16 life-size statues in the Roman classical tradition. I really think it's one of the great masterpieces of architecture in New York. I understand why uh, Stanford White's friends and peers said, this is the building where we want to put a memorial to White. Uh, and so uh, we're going to donate bronze doors in his honor. After the turn of the century, as architectural tastes began to change, Stanford White, ever the entrepreneur, began to reinvent himself as a decorator. Stanford White's interest in decoration was at a couple of levels. First of all, I mean, he thought that these objects were very, very beautiful, and he had a remarkable eye for spotting this kind of beauty. Uh, he also had this ability to combine uh, objects that people would not have thought were combinable. White would not be limited by the constraints of decorative styles. Mixing Renaissance with Baroque with a European hunting lodge. A rug used as a table covering, an outdoor fountain indoors, a moose head surrounded by cherubs. White never met a bare rug he didn't like. I mean, decorators still go around and buy furniture and uh, things like that, but then he would amass huge warehouses of stuff. White became a dealer persuading his wealthy clients to buy certain pieces of furniture, tapestries, or other pieces, things that he had acquired in Europe. He had all these connections to European dealers who would tell him that something was available or on the market, or he, that we, he really had to look at this, you know, linenfold paneled room that was just unique in the world, or this set of tapestries that no one had ever been able to buy before, but now they were able to secure them. White was a true Renaissance man. He was able to not only give these people the houses that they wanted, but he was able to help them buy the furniture that they wanted, to uh, get the paintings that they 
want, whether or not they wanted them, the paintings that they should have gotten, and uh, he was able to advise them on what their parties might be like. Parties for famous clients who attended Stanford White's own parties, many of which were held at White's summer home on the north shore of Long Island overlooking the Sound. In the city, it was still, even if you were on Fifth Avenue, it was still relatively dense and it was hot in the summer, so you wanted a country home. So the New York home would be where you had your events during the season, but then you would go to Hyde Park up on the Hudson, you would go to Newport, you would go to the northern shore of Long Island, you would have your country homes. White called his country home Box Hill. Stanford White really did give big house parties all the time in the summer and spring and fall when he was using Box Hill. So uh, there were a lot of people here, and there's a wonderful guest book. Bessie White kept a record of every weekend guest. Some pretty fancy people show up, and Stanford White was using Box Hill as a marketing tool, and the clients and prospective clients uh, and sort of just general rich pals of uh, McKimbead and White show up in those uh, guest books a lot. Uh, so they were pretty lively parties. It, it is, in fact, a Dutch door, and it opens the, the top half of Sam the White, Stanford's great-grandson, gave us an exclusive tour of the home where he spent many childhood days. The first thing guests see is the unusual treatment of the home's exterior. The texture uh, that you're looking at on the walls of the house is called pebble dash. The original home had been a clabbered-painted farmhouse. White enlarged the home bit by bit, and when it was complete... He decided to cover the house with this material that we call pebble dash, which is essentially beach pebbles from Long Island Sound, which are pressed into wet cement, which is set on wire lath over the, uh, over the clabbered. This was typical of White's interest in texture and color and non-traditional materials. It just picks up the light wonderfully. It gives the house a very special character, and it gives it this extraordinary texture, particularly as you, when you look at it sort of obliquely. Once inside, the white surprises continue. Well, this is the front hall, and uh, this was one of the three formal rooms that Stanford White created for Box Hill. Stanford White was quite interested in the hall as a social space. White had a talent for repurposing. These doors were originally made for the Morgan Library in New York, and apparently Morgan uh, was not satisfied and wanted something in a nobler material, and so Stanford White was more than happy to take the rejects. On the walls, another unexpected material, the split bamboo is quite interesting. Stanford White was just really interested in unusual materials for their, not because they were unusual, but because they had extraordinary textural qualities to them. And uh, so he took this bamboo, which must have cost about $10.50 to do the whole room, and just used it as wallpaper. Box Hill is a window into Stanford White's remarkable imagination. Extraordinary sort of collection of of artifacts from different cultures and different periods. You have these bed warming pans, which are this, this element from, oh, you know, 17th century America, practically. Uh, these uh, elements, they look like giant frying pans on long handles, and you would fill them with hot coals, and you would use them to take the chill off the sheets, uh, which was very welcome in the winter. And what Stanford White loved was the decorative quality of this. He didn't much care the, what period it came from or what country, and so he's juxtaposing that against the split bamboo, and then down at the bottom, uh, you have these lions that are probably from uh, Venice somewhere. The fireplace down at the far end uh, is a, for the most part, a probably a uh, 17th or 18th century Italian antique. My understanding is that some of it is original and some of it was uh, created uh, to pull the original pieces together because there were missing pieces and Stanford White had access to uh, extraordinary craftsmen who were coming into New York at this period of time. They were, there's a huge migration from uh, Europe of very talented craftsmen. And so he was able to get stone carvers and mosaicists and wood carvers and 
um, people who could work in marble uh, very easily and they could make these uh, sort of wonderful things that are not completely original. We're in the living room now, which for some reason my family calls the Baroque room. And it is the oldest part of the house. This room also shows not only a taste of Stanford White, this interest in texture and unusual materials. Here, the walls and ceiling are covered in seagrass and bamboo. The material, though, the wall covering is actually used almost as if it were sort of precious marble because he arranges it in panels. He pays a lot of attention to the proportion and size of the panels. Uh, you have down at the far end uh, the mantelpiece, which uh, is either French or Italian Renaissance, uh, and that's combined with that uh, what's called a fire crane, which is that um, cast as a wrought iron element uh, which uh, holds pots near the fire, and I understand that's something from Spain. An ornament taken from an outdoor fountain is given a second life. What it shows is a, so White's interest in taking ordinary things. A swan is a pretty ordinary animal. You see them all around here in the harbor. But to somehow sort of coax out of this ordinary thing something sort of mildly bizarre or mildly threatening. And uh, this chandelier from Bavaria. The St. Barbara. Uh, the, with this sort of combination of this uh, uh, figure with a snake's tail and the antlers. This is real Stanford White. I mean, he just kind of loved these totally bizarre combinations. This is the original dining room of the house, and this was built by Stanford White in the early 20th century, I would say around 1903, he added the dining room. Uh, and Dining was an important part of the weekends, which was what the house was built for, summers and weekend entertaining. Unlike the rooms in the front of the house, the dining room is bathed in light and brightened by hundreds of Delft tiles from Holland. I think they were, again, relatively inexpensive when he got them now, they'd be quite expensive. Uh, but he took a thousand of these tiles and he laid them out into patterns so that they're really like a rug with borders and fields. Then in the fireplace, the Delft tile sort of tucks in behind me uh, to create a great fireplace. And that fire back was uh, a cast iron element that he got from Versailles. That was his, his genius, was that he could put these things together in a way that no one else had ever uh, thought of or could do. And he just had such a flair. I mean, you, you're actually a little jealous of him. Stanford White was 46 years old at the turn of the 20th century. Despite his success, his life was chaotic. His European antiquing excursions became excessive. And so he made money on these items. Uh, but not enough to save him financially. Like many of his wealthy clients, White was overextended. So unfortunately, much as White built for the robber barons of the United States, many of his principal backers, many of his principal clients, failed totally in the first decade of the 20th century, as he did, flying as Icarus did too close to the sun and melting their very fragile wings. Stanford White was on the ropes, basically, uh, at the time of his death. He had uh, significant deaths. In 1905, a warehouse fire in Manhattan destroyed nearly all the art and antiques he'd planned to use to pay off what he owed. White owed terribly large amounts of money. It said that when he died, or before he died, they. Uh, kind of fired him as a partner and put him on salary because he owed so much money to the firm. Now, no longer a partner in the firm which bore his name. The exuberance he once expressed in the 1899 Washington Square Arch gave way to a more moderate 20th century style. Stanford White is not actually given enough credit for um, taking life seriously that his work does actually move towards more restraint as he gets older. Perhaps the best example of that restraint is the Martyr's Monument in Brooklyn's Fort Greene Park. It's a very dramatic view as you enter from the corner of St. Edwards and Myrtle and you look up this grand staircase with the crypt in the middle, which is really the heart 
of what this memorial is about. The classical Doric column rises 148 feet high on a hill. The Fort Greene Martyrs Memorial is a memorial to the Revolutionary War martyrs who died in Wallabout Bay at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. During the American Revolution, more than 10,000 prisoners of war died in captivity aboard British prison ships docked off what was then British-occupied Brooklyn. Some of the bones of the dead were preserved and are now kept in this crypt. It actually is his very last design. It's been said that it was actually something he was working on the night that he died, uh, laid in the office and put the pen down and you know went to the theater and literally it was the last monument. It was June 25th, 1906. That evening, Stanford White left his office to attend a musical performance on the rooftop of Madison Square Garden. Evelyn Nesbitt and her husband, Harry Thaw, were also there. Before her marriage, Evelyn Nesbitt was an artist's model and chorus girl and Stanford White's mistress. She became known as the girl in the red velvet swing. This 1907 film dramatizes the story of White's seduction. After the affair ended, Evelyn married Harry K. Thaw, a Pittsburgh millionaire with a history of um, mental instability. When Thaw learned of his wife's affair, he became obsessed with Stanford White, obsessed enough to stalk White for months. The stalking ended that night on the rooftop, where during the performance, Thaw walked up to White, pulled out a gun and shot him dead. Stanford White was just 52 years old. What followed was the nation's first trial of the century. Harry Thaw stood accused of murder, but it was the details of Stanford White's life that fascinated the public. The press ate it up. I think for years and years, when anybody thought of Stanford White, they thought of the scandal as really played out in the trial, where the trial was one of the first trials in which they basically put the victim on trial, and uh, Stanford White was the victim, and he was found guilty in that sense. Thaw's defense team produced this silent film and released it in movie theaters one month before his murder trial ended in a hung jury. At a second trial, a year later, Thaw changed his plea to insanity. He was convicted and spent the next seven years in the New Jersey mental institution. Meantime, Stanford White's family was forced to sell what remained of his precious collection at auction just to pay off his debts. White's reputation as an architect was forever tarnished. This kind of exuberance was just inappropriate and um, people just didn't want it anymore. Uh, and then ultimately the, uh, I would say the modern movement in America uh, combined with, I would say the real sort of lack of vitality in terms of what the firm was doing at that point sort of made the Stanford White um, reputation pretty much disappear. White's last work, The Martyr's Memorial, was completed after his death. McKim and Meade continued working, though the White scandal and changing times caused their business to suffer. The excess of the Gilded Age becomes increasingly troubling to people, and certainly by the turn of the century and the beginning of the 20th century, there is a movement against it and a feeling that the income inequality had to be solved in some way. The architecture of the Gilded Age was now out of favor. People said really terrible things about becoming White. They looked back on these three men as not interpreters of European tradition, but rather mere copyists. And they really came to hate them. They didn't see that what the architects were doing is taking the European heritage and fitting it for America, that they made it work for a new world and a new time. And they weren't just copying one building after another after another. McKim and Meade carried on. If it hadn't been for a job they get the next year for the great municipal building behind City Hall in Lower Manhattan, the firm would have been ruined as well. New York City's municipal building was completed in 1914. 
After White's death, the firm also designed the original Pennsylvania station and the James Farley post office. But as buildings went up, others came down. Stanford White's obsession, Madison Square Garden, had never been a financial success. Prohibition, which was imposed in 1920, took much of the pleasure out of White's Pleasure Palace. Let's not forget the Volstead Act. Prohibition, so you couldn't drink in places like that, killed the restaurant business. The building White loved, and where he died, was demolished in 1925. The glittering Diana was rescued from her tower and ended up at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. A sister in bronze now graces the gardens of Box Hill, Stanford White's summer home, which remains in the family. In the 1960s, a cash-strapped New York University abandoned its small Bronx campus. And for a while, White's library, which had fallen into disrepair, was in jeopardy. And fortunately, the city was able to acquire it and convert it into Bronx Community College. So it continues as a place of higher education, whereas it could just have been completely developed as apartment buildings or buildings could have been torn down, but the campus is serving the function it was meant to serve. In 2012, Robert A. M. Stern designed a new library on the campus, right next to the one Stanford White created more than a century before. It picks up on, on one or two of the other buildings that the Kim Eaton White firm did on the campus. It's much bigger. Inspired by the Bibliothèque in Paris, Stern's is a great academic building. It's a gift to the students of Bronx Community College and to the city of New York. I think it's thrilling, and I've heard it from so many people who've been there, students and so forth. They're so thrilled to have a room that they think, this is like being in a real university. This is really a place. And that's what we set out to do, and it's one of my proudest projects. In Stern's facade, one can't help noticing the architect's esteem for Stanford White. We worked very hard to try to match it. I think uh, uh, Stanford White would, he would smile. I think he would smile. Uh, we think he would smile too at the sight of his triumphal arch and the continued exuberance surrounding it. Every time you walk down Fifth Avenue and get to the bottom of Fifth Avenue and see that arch, I mean, I think that is the legacy of Stanford White. These buildings, the work of Stanford White and his partners, represent a golden age of American architecture. When New York and America stepped proudly into the 20th century. The idea that New York was an important city, it was going to be a global economic force and it needed to have a kind of an urban fabric that uh, sort of dignified its position in the world economy. I think that McKinney and White saw that and they advanced that. They strove to make New York City, their city, a world-class city on a par with Paris and with London, and by extension to make America a world-class country on the world stage with France and with England. And they achieved it. By the end of the 19th century, most people agree that New York was now a city comparable to London or to Paris. They were New Yorkers. They lived here, they worked here, and they designed for this city. And yet in their thousand buildings, they gave the face to this nation. In death, sometimes people become mythic, and, and there could be a component of that to Stanford White. Um, but I think his architecture and his monuments speak to, for themselves. And that's why it's always said that there is no monument. We have many monuments in New York City parks and throughout the city, but there is no monument um, to the firm of McKim, Mead and White because you know, they had always stated that they felt that their monuments and their buildings would kind of speak for themselves. A personal note. Years ago, I, I found a great old house on the sea on eastern Long Island, and it was for sale. And 
An architect friend drove up and he identified it on sight, still in his car as a Stanford White House. And he began yelling, buy it, buy it. And I did. And there was a wonderful portrait of a beautiful woman unidentified in the attic. And an old timer visiting me said, ah, Evelyn Nesbitt. I'm always happy there. Thank you for watching Treasures of New York. Funding for Treasures of New York, Stanford White, is provided by the Maringoff Family Foundation, the Paul W. Zucker Foundation, the New York State Council on the Arts, with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature, and Kenneth J. Lane.